So we've covered lots of different angles of best practice when it comes to going through the program, yep. you know, in order to really optimize uh, sufferers' abilities to overcome their emetophobia. Um, but what we haven't kind of touched on, I mean, I don't think so properly anyway, is putting in the right amount of effort for the right, putting in the right kind of effort for, for the, route, the right amount of time. There we are, it's a bit of a mouthful, right? right? Putting in the right kind of effort for the right amount of time. Because there's a, there's a difference, isn't there, between yep. putting in lots of effort and putting in the wrong kind of effort. So if we can, I'd like to have a good chat about what that looks like and how to go about doing so, if you're on my wavelength. Yeah, 100%. Um, well, first of all, people often write into us uh, and email us and say, um, you know, I've been putting in loads of effort, but I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. And that can be very, very true. And, and, and some, you know, what a metaphobes are like, they, they can put in a tremendous amount of effort and not really feel like they're getting where, or in fact, not actually get anywhere. And that's because they're not putting in the right kind of effort. You know, if you're, if you're driving all day long in that direction, trying to get somewhere that's over there, you're just going to get massively frustrated, aren't you? And feel powerless because you're not getting closer to your goal. Mm. So it's really important that they're putting in the right amount of effort, but the right amount of the right sort of effort. They've it's got... like, um, you know, have you ever had those dreams where you're, you're running, but you're so slow and sluggish, yes. and you're just not moving in the right yeah. direction. And it is the most frustrating. That, feeling and that, that's a, pa and that's a powerless dream. Yeah. That, that's a yeah. dream of feeling yes. powerless. Mm. So it's, it's the same thing. And, and the, the, the difficulty for metaphobes is that they're very bright, they're very driven and they, they put lots and lots of effort in and they can actually, excuse me. They can actually put, this is even more complex, lots of the right effort in, but be missing one key thing. And that one key thing that they're missing can blow the whole show. You know, as an example, um, we've talked before about perfectionism, okay? So they can be putting in lots of effort, uh, uh, in all the right things within the manual, all the right exercises, okay? But if they're not challenging their perfectionism, and therefore they are maintaining low self-esteem as well. And if they're maintaining low self-esteem, they're also going to be maintaining a certain amount of social anxiety. They're going to find it difficult to overcome their metaphobia. And they could get massively frustrated. They could say, they could think, I'm doing all of this stuff. I'm doing everything. I'm doing five hours a day. Why aren't I, why aren't I getting much better? And it's because, you know, they're taking two steps forward and one step back because there's something clearly that they're not getting or not doing and that usually, again, comes down to the desire for control, stopping them from seeing what they really need to be doing. Yeah. And so they do more of one thing within the manual than something else. They might decide, oh, I'm really going to focus on this because this is really important. You and I know we update that manual on a monthly basis. You know, there's nothing in there that they don't need. And, and the the right emphasis is on everything they need to be doing, right? So they should just do what the manual says and nothing else. Don't don't think, oh, I really need to work harder on this or I need to do more of this. Mm. Don't do that. Just do exactly what the manual says and you should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Also, just, you know, noting that it's, it's something that I hear very often when it comes to... Um, a someone that's that's messaging me or reaching out for a bit of help in relation to their emetophobia and they've gone through the, the program on their own and they're hitting a few hurdles along the way and often the go-to and i you know i personally fell into that trap i remember when i was having a little bit of a rocky time to start with i'd want to pick the manual up and start rereading it through and over and over and over yeah but the big part of what i was missing was not the doing part right I, I wasn't really putting a lot of effort into the the doing the actions that are all there and so important at the end but just getting so hyper fixated on i just need to i need to read it i need to read it over and over and as long as i understand every single word that's in there then i'm going to get over it and it it i think it just feels like a a nice safety net to turn to when you're having a bit of a, a difficult time. Well, I'm just going to go back and read it from the start again. Right? You know, don't, don't, don't forget the desire, the desire for control um, is, is usually massive with uh, emetophobes and that desire for control 
you know, means they really, really trying hard not to make a mistake, really, really trying hard not to get it wrong, yeah. really, really, you know, and I get emails, you know, asking me about a single word in the manual. Did you mean that word or do you mean this word? And I'm like, just relax. You know, it's much easier. You know, you only need to put in <clears throat> 70 or 80 percent effort or focus of what's in the manual and you and you'll get through the program that's all you need to do okay uh, they put themselves under so much pressure understandably right and it's that desire for control kicks in and the desire for control a lot of the time for metaphobes is the thirst for knowledge they think mm. by reading the manual again they're they're certainly going to get better and they're compelled to read the manual again um in the same way that sometimes they're compelled to check that the doors are locked or compelled to wash their hands it's not actually helping you know, I once had an email from someone saying, I've read the manual from, from cover to, to cover to cover, you know, 10 times now. And I said, you know, you could read it 100 times. It's not going to get rid of your emetophobia. You know, mm. you could read a book about losing weight. It's not going to get you to lose weight. You then got to start eating properly. You then got to put it into practice every day. It's the doing part of it. Mm. Now, the other difficulty here is, I know your next question is going to be, well, you know, what is the right way to do? How how do we get someone to put in the right amount of effort? Yep. You know you're putting in the right amount of effort if you feel powerful. Okay. If you are seeing in your mind's eye that journey that we've talked about several times before from Cambridge to London on that road, if you're seeing that road and it's clear to you, and you can see how if I just do this for X number of weeks, I can see and I really believe I understand how and why I'm going to overcome my metaphobia. you feel powerful because you see yeah. a light at the end of the tunnel, you see the end of your journey, you see your goal. And if you feel powerful, you feel relaxed because you stop panicking. And you know that if I just keep doing this every day in the same way as if you were exercising and eating more healthily, okay, you might only be losing, you know, a, a, a gram a day, right? But but you're losing a gram a day and you know if you keep doing that, you're going to get there. So you put in more effort and you put in more of the right effort when you feel powerful, mm. okay? So the trick for the emetophobe, for the sufferer, is is to feel powerful about overcoming their phobia. If they're not feeling powerful, if they're not feeling, yes, I've got this, this is it. I can see how this is going to do it. Oh, thank goodness for that. I found the right thing. I've got this. If they're not feeling like that, then take a step back and ask yourself why. Because we've talked before about people that go through the, the program really, really quickly. And I've mentioned before, there's a, one of our testimonials, an American lady, and she'd videoed every week going through the program. I think she did it by herself. But she, her first video is when she's in a, in a car and she's saying, the moment I picked the manual up, I just knew... It, I, I was going to get over it. And you can see the smile on her face. She's still got a metaphobia right there and then. She's still got it, as mm. bad as she ever had it. But she feels empowered because you can see the journey ahead. Yep. So if someone's sitting there and they've got the manual, or even if they're working with a coach or one of the online courses or something, and they're still really, really anxious and, and about the possibility of getting over it and, and they, they still feel kind of helpless, which we'll touch upon in a minute, and hopeless, and they're just thinking, oh my God, you know, I hope this, I hope this thing works, I hope I'm going to get somewhere with this. They should take a step back because they're missing something. Mm. When you feel powerful, okay, you put in effort and you put in yeah. more effort. You put in more effort and you feel... Um, motivated you can see a light the tunnel if you've got the manual <clears throat> right this isn't a manual this is Anthony Bourdain Cook's tour right but if you've got, <laughs> if, you've got great the, if you've got the manual and you you go oh, right I've got it now I, I can see it I understand it I understand now how I, I created my metaphobia and I understand how I'm going to uncreate my, my, my metaphobia I know I just have to go through these stages each week mm. and it's going to get a little bit better all the time. Okay. If you're not feeling like that, you're missing something. And, and if you're not feeling like that, you possibly, probably even won't get to the point where you're putting in enough of the right effort 
to overcome it. Because unless you understand how you're going to overcome it, how can you put in the right amount of effort? Yeah. You, you're going to end up focusing too hard or too much in one direction. Mm. Yeah. So, so it's most important that the first thing they get is understanding why it works, understanding how it works, understanding that they weren't born with emetophobia, that they've created it by a combination of their attitudes, behaviours, thinking styles, beliefs, this kind of stuff, okay? And they've got to this point with it, and what they have to do is unpick those things and and calm all those thinking styles and change those beliefs and take these actions to overcome some of these hurdles they've got. And if that's a clear path for you, you'll go, you'll relax, you'll think, right, got it. Okay, you still got your metaphobia, so you're still terrified, you're still not going out, you're still washing your hands 50 times a day, you're still doing all of these things. So you can feel powerful and anxious at the same time. And let me give you a tiny example. So it's a windy, rainy day down here in Devon, right? And if someone's got seasonal affective disorder and they believe that the weather is making them depressed, Whilst they believe that the weather is making them depressed, they're going to stay depressed, okay? Because that's what they believe, okay? The moment they understand a little bit more about locus of control in space, and it's not actually the weather making them depressed, but rather the way they're reacting to and thinking about the weather, I'm still depressed right now, mm. okay? I feel just as bad, but at least I know intellectually that it's not the weather. So I feel a little bit empowered. At least I don't feel powerless. At least I don't think for the rest of my life, I'm screwed. I'm always going to be depressed. Now I feel slightly empowered. Okay, right. I can see a light at the end of the tunnel. I, I'm still in a shit place right now because I'm still really depressed. Mm. But at least I understand right. So there's something I can do to change this. And it's that empowerment that drives me to put in enough of the right amount of effort because I can mm. see what I need to do. If they can't see what they need to do, how can they possibly do enough of the right thing? How can you possibly put enough of the right effort in if you can't see what you need to do? Yeah, a, um, a comparable analogy that I, often quite, that, that I quite often give out in my sessions is in relation to emetophobia because... For, for the most part, emetophobia sufferers have gone and seen lots and lots of different kinds of help in their quest to overcome what is deeply miserable, right? And it's like if you if you go to the doctors, right, first port of call, I'm really struggling with my emetophobia, there's something that needs addressing. I'm going to go to the doctors, I'm going to get the help I need. And you sit down with the doctor and they look at you and you go, Rob, I'm so sorry, mate. I'm so sorry, you've got emetophobia with... There's nothing we can do about that, right? There's no cure. It doesn't exist. It's going to be stuck with it. We can, we can medicate you. We can help you. We can get you to learn to live with it a little bit better. But you've got to accept that it's just going to be something that you're going to die with, right? How powerful are you going to feel? Yeah. How motivated are you going to feel about putting in the right kind of effort for long enough to overcome your phobia? Absolutely. I'm completely powerless. Yeah? Absolutely. Completely powerless. But as soon as, as you say in the same way with seasonal affective disorder, as you begin to understand that it isn't something that's happening to you, then you start to, you, you get a bit more wiggle room, right? Yeah. Your feet feel a bit more firmly planted on the floor. Maybe I can, you know, I don't completely, I'm not absolutely sold and utterly convinced, right? Maybe not in that moment, but at least now I'm like, oh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe I can, maybe I can, right? What, what can I start doing now? How can I start going about this in the right way? And then I'm going to get there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the sad thing is, or the sadder thing is, that if you went to your doctor and said, I've got emetophobia, they wouldn't say to you, sorry, you're stuck with it. They would say, what's emetophobia? Yeah. All the research says still, you know, it's now, what is it, 2023. Most doctors, most general practitioners, most therapists, most psychiatrists do not know what emetophobia is often misdiagnosed and they they just assume it's a normal phobia 
and the mm. most common reaction is you need to expose yourself to it to get over it. Yep. They just don't understand it at all. So that, like you say, it's incredibly disempowering. It's incredibly disempowering. Now, we talked uh, uh, a while back about learned helplessness. And I used to have one of the quizzes for learned helplessness in the early editions of the manual, and we took it out. And this is going to sound like I'm being a little bit pedantic now, but it's important. We took it out because, generally speaking, emetophobes don't suffer from learned helplessness in relation to their emetophobia, okay? They suffer from feeling powerless, but it's not a learned helplessness. So a learned helplessness is where you've repeatedly tried to do kind of the right thing to get out of your situation, and every time you hit a brick wall and you get to the point where you then stop trying. Okay? So emetophobes, generally speaking, don't stop trying, for one. Okay? Secondly, they were already powerless because they already had the phobia. So that's the problem. The phobia leaves you feeling powerless because it's such a disabling, horrible phobia as you know it's such a disabling horrible phobia and don't forget emetophobes generally speaking are very powerful people that are normally very successful in their lives and they're bright and they're driven and they're motivated so it feels even worse then you know if you're if you're really functioning at quite a high level in almost every area of your life but in one small area you're terrified and petrified and powerless that's really going to hurt more so than hurting someone that didn't feel up here about everything else. Mm, yep. So so the disparity is massive. So they feel powerless to overcome their phobia. They don't, it's not a learned helplessness. Okay. It's, it's, it's a powerlessness because of how powerless the phobia leaves you feeling. Okay, so it's, it sounds a little bit pedantic. We're quibbling over terms, but it's a different. It's a different thing, and it's unfair. I thought it was unfair to describe that feeling in the metaphobes as learned helplessness, because actually they're not helpless, mm. and they don't stop putting in effort. No, they don't. No. Okay, and they don't stop trying. And there's not one day goes by in their life when they go, "Ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just going to stick with this." Yeah. I'm just going to yeah. put up this. When it comes to, to treating clients, it's emetophobes more than anyone, anyone that struggles with any mental health disorder, it's emetophobes more than anyone that has gone to see the most yeah. amount of specialists mm. in their journey to overcoming it. Um, someone struggling with depression might have gone to a talking therapist for the last five years, but they haven't gone and tried every single avenue no. in order to try and overcome it, whereas an emetophobe, they've done it all they've gone to see everyone every time pretty much so they don't they don't tend to they don't lose their will to get over it what they don't have is is a belief that it's going to happen but ironically they don't lose their will they don't stop trying they just lose their belief mm -hmm. that's why it's so important that when they've got our manual in front of them or they're going through with a coach that they don't just plod through it like 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 Anthony's recipe right you know you follow a recipe right you don't think about how the recipe is going to work or or how it's going to create the I don't anyway how it's going to create the end product right you follow the instructions it's a manual for how to cook a meal you follow the instructions hey presto it comes out right you can't do that with the metaphobia and that's why I wrote the manual in the way that I wrote it because you have to understand how you're going to overcome it and why it's so predictable that you're going to overcome it. Because that then makes you go, oh, right, I get it. I don't feel powerless anymore. This is the thing that's going to make a difference. This is the thing that's going to get me over it. I'm going to focus on this. I get it. Mm. And that's then what makes you motivated enough to put in the right amount of effort um, the right amount of time. And on that note, if you think about what is the right amount of effort, we have 50,000 thoughts a day-ish, okay? And most emetophobes that we've asked or polled at various times reckon that somewhere around 90% of their thoughts every day are either directly 
or indirectly related to metaphobia, right? That's 45,000 thoughts a day. Most of your thoughts a day. Imagine, horrible thought, imagine that you're in a horrible situation at the moment where, where a loved one is very, very close to you, is dying, right? And they are days or weeks away. What a horrible situation to be in. Okay, this is for non-emetophobes that are listening to this podcast, right? Yeah, just That's going to be on your mind all day, every day. Yeah, I just saw a car turn up over the road. Is is that is that a relative come to tell me? I just saw the phone ring. Is that about it? You know, there's a noise. What's going to happen? You know, it's going to be on my mind all the time, isn't it? This horrible, overbearing, emotional pressure is going to be there the whole time. So if you've got 45,000 thoughts a day, if it's on your mind, in the back of your mind, from the moment you wake up in the morning till the moment you go to bed at night, and those are just the thoughts, you've got all the unhelpful beliefs, and there'll be hundreds of those that are driving the thoughts. And then you've got things like thinking styles, attitudes, behaviours, all the other things within the programme, locus of control, sense of power and control. There are... You know, I tried to work it out recently. You know, basically thousands of things happening every day. Imagine a watch, an old-fashioned watch or clock with a thousand cogs in it. Okay, and those thousands of cogs are causing and maintaining your emetophobia. Okay, that's a lot of things you've got to change to overcome it. Okay, that's a lot of things that have to change. From you to be going that direction to be going in that direction. So think, you know, reading the manual for an hour a day, brilliant. That, that's that's great. But then you've got to be doing it all day, every day as well, because you're changing thousands of thoughts. You're changing, you're updating, you're you're challenging hundreds of unhelpful beliefs that are driving you down the wrong road. You've got all those thinking styles, perfectionism, black and white thinking, all of those things, catastrophic thinking. All of those things that are creating and maintaining this furor in your brain all the time. That's a lot of work you've got to do. But actually, when you feel powerful, it's easy. Because all you need to do is focus on that journey. Okay, You don't need to be thinking, oh, what about this? What about that? What about that? What is it? Yep. You just yep. want to be doing what you need to be doing to be thriving. You don't need to find out what's going wrong. You just need to do what's right. And that is calming down your thinking, challenging unhelpful beliefs, doing things that are building your self-esteem, that are building social confidence, building self-efficacy, looking at those beliefs where, you, where you're where thinking it's happening to you, challenging maybe later on some of the safety-seeking thoughts, not necessarily the behaviours, you can carry on with doing those till the cows come home as long if you want, you, know, that we, you don't have to change those, but thinking about why you're doing it, what are the implications of it. So there's... There's a, a, a lot that needs to change, but it doesn't require a tremendous amount of effort. What it does, though, is require enough effort of the right type mm. every day, all day, every day. Okay, If you did that all day, every day, and you put all that effort into thriving, remember, thriving is the antidote. This is why this is the only program that predictably works for uh, curing emetophobes okay it, it's the antidote to it. thriving is the antidote not overcoming emetophobia the cure for emetophobia right is not overcoming emetophobia that's not going to cure emetophobia right if there was a tablet to cure you of emetophobia you wouldn't get over your emetophobia because it wouldn't work because your emetophobia is caused by these 45,000 thoughts today, these beliefs, these attitudes, these behaviours, right? So it wouldn't cure you even if there were a tablet for it. Yep. And this is why CBT doesn't work. It's why exposure therapy doesn't work, okay? Because it's not about those things. It's about the absence of thriving. Mm. Thriving is the cure for metaphobia, okay? Not fight. And imagine if you've got to find... 45 unhelpful thoughts every day, right? It's basically one a second, right? There's one, there's one, there's one. You can't possibly do that. It's, it'd be exhausting. So yeah. you don't try and find what's going wrong. You do what's right. 
And what's right is thriving. What's right is calming down thinking styles, building up self-belief, building up confidence, uh, um, uh, overcoming uh, um, powerlessness, starting to feel more powerful, understanding yourself, understanding how you created these thoughts, these beliefs, these feelings, challenging it, challenging things like disgust propensity and all those other things. I've just done a new quiz, by the way, on disgust propensity. I'll tell you about it later on. Um, and all of those things, they help you to understand how you've created it. And when you understand how you create it, it makes perfect sense how to uncreate it. Mm. Okay, yep. still going to take effort. You're still going to have to work your ass off for six, eight, ten weeks. But when you feel powerful, you know, we talked before about the couch to 5K, which I've now completed, right? You know, it, it, was, it was a lot of effort over, it took me about five months, right? It was a lot of effort over five months. But now I can do it easily. Now I can do it right now. I could go outside in the horrible weather now for you, and, bro. Well done. and probably Proud run 5K, not even jog it. I could run it, okay? Mm. Because I could see, with the help of the notes in the app, how as long as every day I was doing a little bit that was moving me forward in the right direction, that in weeks or months, I would get to my 5K. Okay? It's easy, and I felt powerful. But if I couldn't see myself getting in the right direction, I'd feel powerless and I'd worry, wouldn't I? Mm. So you've got to see that you're getting in the right direction. And to see that you're going in the right direction, you need to understand the journey. And understanding the journey means understanding how you created a metaphobia. When I understand how I got there, I know how to get back. And the, yeah, answer, that, is, the answer is thriving. I was asked the other day um, by someone on my, on my Instagram asking why the unhelpful thinking styles weren't at the start of the program. Because they said that it seems to be the, the number one thing that I'm noticing and wanting to challenge are these un, all of these unhelpful thinking styles that I'm just exuding on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was trying to explain exactly what we've just talked about, right? In terms of the, the layout of the manual is the layout for a reason, right? Yeah. Because without initially understanding your cognition, how your beliefs affect your ability to thrive, and then you begin to understand locus of control. And without doing it in that order, it doesn't make sense. Just, no. you know, if, if you just look to the unhelpful thinking styles, if that came along first, you're not really going to understand, well, why am I perfectionist? How is that something that's happening to me? Yeah. Right. I don't, and, I don't and, also, and also, by the time you get to the thinking styles chapter, the thinking styles have already reduced significantly yeah. because you've already started to challenge and change the beliefs that were driving them. Imagine yeah. if the belief section or the cognition section wasn't in there, right? And, you, and it was only a manual about thinking styles. Okay, great, here you go. I could give you the best manual in the world about thinking styles, Joe, right? But you are having 45,000 thoughts a day. You can't possibly challenge all of those. You can't possibly find all of those and then it's decide to try. Yeah, there's an unhelpful thought. Yeah, but is it, is it a paranoid thought? Is it a catastrophic thought? Is it black mm. and white? Am I being a perfectionist? Yeah. That, would drive, that would drive your average emetophobe mad um, because you, you can't do that. You can't focus on that one area. So like you yeah. said, the manual is written in that way to be the most empowering way of them getting yeah. through that. But that's what you just said. That's a really good example of the wrong kind of effort because yeah. what are you doing by focusing all day on all of these unhelpful thinking styles and nothing else? You're focusing what you're doing wrong, right? You're, you're just focusing on... There I go again, being all obsessional. Yeah. There I go again, being all catastrophic. Why am I doing that? God, I'm, I'm such an idiot. I'm, I'm never going to get over this. Yeah. What am I doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the other, the other thing, the, the the simple example for that would be: so imagine I've got social anxiety, okay, which is again just a, just a belief, and imagine there's a, a dinner party tonight that I've been invited to, and right now I know it's I know it's at eight o'clock tonight I've got to go there and it's probably about 11 o'clock now I don't know what time it is now about 11 o'clock now right but I'm already having these thoughts in my mind about who's going to be there what am I going to wear am I supposed to be taking food am I taking drink what about the weather um you know what if I turn up in shorts and a t-shirt you know and everyone else is in jeans and a coat you know uh, um what's the right time they said eight o'clock but doesn't do they mean eight o'clock if I get them first, I'm going to feel a right prune, aren't I? But I don't want to be late either. 
If they're going to serve food at half eight, I don't get there at nine. That's embarrassing. What's the right? And I've got all these thoughts seeming like they're just coming into my mind spontaneously out of the ether. Okay, hundreds of thoughts I might have during the day today, maybe even thousands of thoughts about this party tonight. But those thoughts only exist because I've got the belief about social anxiety, right? If I just resolve that belief, mm. I have no thoughts. Yep. So it's much easier to, to change the belief that is creating and driving those thousands of thoughts a day than it is to try and resolve the thoughts. Imagine mm. I wasn't going to change. Imagine I wasn't going to look at my belief about social anxiety and about being judged and about the implications of being late or turning up with food instead of wine or shorts instead of jeans or there's someone there I don't like or there's someone there I feel inferior to or whatever. Instead of that, I just work on the belief. All those thoughts disappear. So those 45,000 thoughts a day are driven by 25 to 30 beliefs. And actually, only two or three beliefs are causing most of those 45,000 thoughts a day. Just two or three beliefs. Mm. It's much easier to work on those two or three beliefs than the 45,000 thoughts. Yep. But the, the average emetophobe, having that desire for control and that thirst for knowledge and understanding... And, and things that they believe they can do right now mm. will dive into whatever part of the manual that yep. they want to focus on. Yep. You know, and we would counsel them strongly not to do that, just to work through it slowly. Well, what's the, what's the first exercise at the beginning of the manual? It's identifying limiting beliefs. It's the first thing that you have to do when yep. you're going through it. It's, it's there for a reason. Yeah. So it's really funny, but well, not funny, ironic, maybe, not even ironic understandable that of all the people that go through the thrive program some falter at the declaration at the beginning mm. i've never known a metaphor to do that mm. that 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 you know the the declaration is i'm going to work hard i'm going to be nice to myself i'm going to be diligent i'm going to study the manual i'm going to do all these exercises i want to get over this thing i want to learn yep. to thrive sometimes people going through the program falter a little bit but that and don't want to do it because they don't want to commit to putting the effort i've never known an emetophobe say i didn't want to sign that yeah so they're not they're not frightened of effort they're not they're not frightened of hard work they're not frightened of um committing to getting over it so it's none of those things it's the right amount of the right effort and that really only comes from them understanding how they've created it and how they and therefore feel empowered about getting over it yep. yep yep so they want to be empowered they want to be feeling yes i got it i can see what i need to do Whew, what a relief i still got my metaphobia right now i still feel terrible and my life is still you know ruined you know badly affected every day but i can see the light at the end of the tunnel what i need to be doing yeah, as, as soon as it's, it's no longer happening to me, okay, great, I get that now, right? It's no longer happening to me. So if I'm doing it, what am I doing? And as soon as I understand what I'm doing to create my emetophobia, and then I am given a way to undo what I'm doing and overcome that, then I feel very powerful about putting in the right kind of effort. Yeah, there, is a, mo there is a moment there, though. You know, and this again is why they want to do the program as it's laid out in the manual. There is a moment where if you get it wrong, you know, that if I, if I, the moment I realize that it's not the weather making me depressed, okay, it's not happening to me, I'm doing it to myself, what a relief, I feel empowered now. If I now don't put in the right amount of effort moving forward, it's possible I could make myself feel even worse because now I just feel it's my fault as well. Mm, yeah. Now I'm just an idiot. It was all right when I believed it was happening to me. Mm. I was helpless, right? But at least it wasn't my fault. Now I'm helpless and it is my fault. Yeah. And all of a sudden my illusion of feeling in control has crumbled down around me. Yeah, even and now more I so. Feel... Yeah. yeah. So it's got, it's got to be the, the right amount of effort uh, and that only comes from the confidence in understanding how I've created it and how I'm going to uncreate it 
and, and that's all about the thriving aspect. Don't worry about what you're doing wrong. Focus on what to do right. And that's ha having helpful, supportive, charitable, kind beliefs, empowering beliefs. It's about having helpful thinking styles. It's about putting an effort every day to feel more empowered. The moment I overcome my belief about social anxiety, those thousands of thoughts I would have every day, gone. Because yep. they didn't come from the ether. They didn't come from the sky. They weren't sent to me by someone in outer space, right? The belief I had was driving those thoughts. My anticipation of, oh, this party tonight's going to be horrible. I really need to know who's going, what's going to happen. Otherwise, I'm just not going to go. My control skills, my desire for control and my control skills are going to say, Rob, if you can't make yourself feel comfortable about going tonight, I'm just not going to go and cancel. Okay, so I'm overthinking about it all day long. All of that goes in a heartbeat the moment I overcome my social anxiety. All of those thoughts were driven by that one belief. Hmm. So get the beliefs right, challenge those beliefs, build powerful beliefs, and none of those thoughts happen. Yep, yep. That's why it's laid out that way. Yep, yep. The, the initial module of the manual, challenging beliefs. And yep. when you're going through it, I think it's... Feel free to expand on it as well for me, Rob. But uh, setting the perspective of going through it, I think, is really important because getting thriving and therefore overcoming your emetophobia doesn't look like that. It looks like that, yeah. right? I have never worked with an emetophobic client who hasn't had at least one or two blips oh, yeah. whilst going through the program. You do not need to do it perfectly. You do not need to figure it out and be the perfect thriver every single day and just know it all instantly. You know, if you if you started trying to learn a new language for the first time ever, you're gonna mispronounce words, you're gonna get it wrong. Yeah. You're gonna forget to follow your Duolingo alarm when it goes off, you, you're gonna get it a bit wrong. So the sooner that you accept that, but you continue regardless well, that's that, yeah, that's kind, that's kind of the the doing it right thing, isn't it? You know, if you, if if you're trying to overcome a metaphobia, but you're still being a perfectionist, you're going to find it really hard. That that's not the right way. That's not what a thriving person does. A thriving person doesn't beat themselves up every time they get it wrong. Yeah. So that that's the right way. Yeah. What can I learn from this? What can I learn from this? Yeah. Right, okay, so I'm having, I'm having a shit day today. I'm having a blip today and I'm really anxious. Okay, what have I done to get here? You know, what? how do I get out of this? How do I minimise it? How can I do it differently tomorrow? How can I do it differently? And then you know, the, the drawing you did was, was, was correct. You know, the, the early hurdles and blips tend to be quite big and then towards the end they get smaller and smaller and smaller until you iron them out. Yep. And it's normal. So normal. Yeah. It happens to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, you know, it's it's not go it's not going to be a smooth ride for most people because of there are so many components, you know, and so many thinking styles and so many things outside until they start to build coping skills, so many things beyond your control. I don't know who's going to go to the party tonight. I didn't know what the weather was going to be today. I didn't know that I was going to feel a little bit funny today because I may have eaten something last night. All those external things might scupper my plans and put hurdles in my way. You know, I'm not, if I was just living off in a castle somewhere by myself and going through the program for six to eight weeks and eating perfectly cooked food every day and not seeing anybody, it'd be much easier. But life is unpredictable and emetophobes haven't yet learnt to respond to those unpredictable external events, all of them at least in really helpful ways. So there are going to be hurdles and blips as they go through the programme. But again, if you're feeling empowered and understanding and you're having a blip, you can go, right, I'm feeling really, really anxious and shit today, but I can see why, I can see what I've done. That thing last night, I'm reacting to that and I can see that I went that way and I could have gone that way. Right, I know what to do what to do to calm my thinking down. I know what to do to get out of this fug that I'm in and move on. And I make some notes and I've learned something that I'm going to put into practice next time. 
and that's that's why the feeling powerful part is so important yeah yeah fantastic anything else you want to add i think that's it all right cool yeah lovely all right well i'll see you on the next podcast i hope you enjoyed everyone